Anyway, well, you, do you prefer Bella, Isabella? What do you What do you prefer to be called? Bella is good. Bella. Bella is good. And if I'm not mistaken, you go by either is it steak and butter girl or steak and butter gal? I can't remember which one. Ah, steak and butter gal. <laughs> steak and butter gal. All right. Well, I, and yeah, and I know you. I know that you are an accomplished musician because I know you just you send me a lot of these. The, Instagram stories, you play the piano and I guess my violin too. I can't remember. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, tell us about that. Tell us a little bit about your background for folks that, that, aren't, that have not run into you before. And then I've got a whole bunch of, I've been watching some of your videos recently just to, uh, uh, and I tried making your egg pudding or egg custard. <laughs> so anyway, we'll talk about that, but let, let us know about your background real quick. Sure. So um, I studied music my whole life, uh, classical music to be exact. I started uh, playing the piano and violin at age seven and I kind of fell in love instantly and decided to pursue it as my career. So I studied undergrad in New York City at the new school and then I went on to do my master's at the Juilliard School and I just graduated this spring. So Upon graduation, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Upon graduation, I hope to pursue performing as my main career, just performing, freelancing um, around the city, the country, um, and competing. Uh, but I also am super passionate about diet and how that affects mental health because as a musician, mental health is so important. Um, just your mental clarity, your ability to be resilient to high stress and pressure. So I'm just very fascinated by how the carnivore diet is so effective. It's changed my life. Yeah, and I, and I, I think that's fair to, I think that's a good thing to get into because I mean, as a, you know, and I, I, I'll be the first one to admit I have, if there could be negative musical ability, that's what I would have. I've got zero. And my little, my little boy, I mean, my little boy, my seven-year-old son, he's in there. He's, he's been doing piano since I think age four and he's actually getting pretty darn good. I'm listening to him, you know, and I'm like, well, that's a hell of a lot better than I could ever dream of doing. So awesome. it's something I think is awesome. I just never, never developed that aspect of my brain or my skill. And I, but I understand, you know, I can see where it takes tremendous concentration and there's very little room for error and you just have to be able to, you know, a lot of cognitive and, you know, uh, neurologic things are have to be going on. So it'll be interesting. I've talked to other musicians who've been on a carnivore diet and they've had some really interesting things that they've told me about how it has affected their performance in a positive way. But let's go into, because, uh, so, you know, you're doing the music stuff. I know I saw you said, you know, you'd tried different diets. You'd been on a vegan diet for years. You know, I mean, now you're eating steak and butter and making egg pudding and you're not eating a bunch of vegetables <laughs> yeah. and fruits. What, yeah. what, got, how did you go down that route? I mean, what, what p propelled you to do that? And, you know, what, why are you where you are today? Um, and, and how's it been working out for you? Yeah, so I became exposed to the vegan diet last year of high school. I was a senior, I was 18 years old, and I was very much immersed in being on stage all of the time. I would be performing in front of so many people. It's just a lot of pressure, uh, body image-wise. As a young girl, I felt a lot of pressure from my parents as well to be in shape, to look confident on stage. And I became desperate because I was gaining a lot of weight um, before I became vegan, I was on a very standard American Chinese type of diet, lots of plant seed oils, just lots of junk processed food. And I was gaining a lot of weight. So I started doing a simple Google search. How can I lose weight fast? You know, cause I have concerts coming up. And the first thing that appeared was this lady called Freely the Banana Girl. She was huge on YouTube at that time. And she was really advocating this vegan diet where it's raw till four, you eat tons of fruits in the daytime and then you eat cooked plant foods. So I tried it and I actually lost weight and I started to be brainwashed believing that this diet is healthy because I look skinny. Um, so I started being very committed to this diet. And um, six years later, basically, I, I stuck to it for six years because when I'm committed, I really stay committed. Um, and after six years, it was just so, so many issues that came up. I lost my period. Um, I started gaining weight again. My weight was basically fluctuating all over the place during those six years. My skin was breaking out like crazy. Um, my hair was shedding. Um, so it was just time to stop. And I was 
already dreaming about my egg pudding that my mama uh, <laughs> raised me on. So I was dreaming about animal foods and I decided to just make the plunge and start eating meat again. But before I quit the vegan diet, I feel very grateful and lucky to have found you on Joe Rogan's podcast. I must say that I really just obsessively researched so much about this carnivore diet and your voice, your advocacy was very helpful in convincing me to give it a try. So I'm very, very grateful. Changed my life. <laughs> I mean, I want to, I want to delve a little bit more because you said standard American diet and most of us here in America kind of know what that is, but you'd also mentioned standard Chinese diet. And so yes. what is that exactly for us yes. that aren't immersed in, um, the, in, in, in the Chinese culture and what's going on in China? So Chinese diet centers a lot around meat, yes, but those meat dishes are cooked with a lot of oils, and it's usually seed oils, extremely refined processed plant oils, like canola oil, sunflower oil, and on top of that, it's seasoned heavily with uh, soy sauce, with all these uh, oyster processed fish sauces with a lot of gluten, MSG, um, so it's a lot of those chemicals. Okay, so um, I mean, you lost weight. I mean, I mean, you're obviously not struggling with weight, and you know, and I, you know, we do see a lot of people have success with a plant-based diet or a vegan diet where they do lose weight, and I think some of that has to do with they're just not taking in yeah. nutrition or they're not absorbing nutrition. And I mean, some people point that there's an advantage. You can eat all this fibrous food, and you don't really absorb it. You just kind of end up having large bowel movements and having a lot of your calories or yes. potential calories go down, go down the toilet. And so, uh, so what was there something that like, where was the thought where like six years of this? And then I'm like, I'm not going to do, cause at some point I think most, and I may not be right on this, but, but I suspect most people that start to get into a vegan diet, do it for some belief about the environment, belief about uh, animal ethics, um, the health benefits, maybe, I mean, some people may believe that, but I think it, I think I would be surprised if there are any long-term vegans that don't at least feel like they are helping the environment or helping animal suffering. So yeah. going from there, what sort of was the, the, the sort of the moment or the issue that said, Hey, I just can't continue to do this. Um, absolutely. So when I was vegan, I was very proud to be vegan for the ethical reasons. Um, but firstly, it's not that sustainable. They should be doing more research because eating um, meat and animal products is not nearly as detrimental to the earth. Um, but the, the turning point for me to give meat, you know, a try again uh, was basically me not having my period for a very long time. And I was just sick of it. And I, I really want to have kids. So I was just very afraid of just that to, to, to feel like I don't have the ability to reproduce. Um, and I could see the negative side effects of not having a period. For example, my skin issues and my autoimmune issues, eczema, psoriasis uh, flared up all the time. I would be bleeding uh, when I wake up in the morning because I've been scratching all night long and the psoriasis would be centered around my temples and it would just really affect my self-esteem. Um, I was just not in a good place mentally or physically, not feeling confident. Well, and I mean, I'm just looking, I mean, to me, I mean, you look like you have pretty much very beautiful skin just from, oh, from what you. I can see on camera I obviously you know the, the camera you can't see everything but I mean I mean just looking at you you definitely don't look like you have problems with skin right now um some people will say hey you just weren't eating enough calories and we see this with people with you know regardless of the dietary choices they they, they lose their periods but you know women obviously um when they just don't take in enough calories so did you attempt to try to like maybe eat more calories eat more fat you know plant-based fats mm -hmm. how did you try to deal with the fact that you were you were amenorrheic and having some of these issues in the context of a plant-based diet yeah so i was firstly not eating any processed uh plant foods like those mock meats none of that was part of my diet i was very strict in eating a whole foods plant-based diet um so i would be eating a lot of fruits and for my fat i gave a lot of um 
avocados a try, except I didn't feel great. Like the digestion was just not feeling good. The bloating was a huge issue. Um, I just looked like I was pregnant and I, <laughs> I didn't feel like I could wear clothes that I wanted to wear. Um, and I did eat quite a lot of calories. I was eating, you know, tons of vegetables steamed uh, with lots of nutritional yeast for the B12, um, avocados, tons of fruits, and then the starches because that was a huge thing in Freely's world. So carbs, uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, brown rice, rice, wild rice, white rice, oatmeal. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, we hear those foods all the time as being healthy recommendations, you know, maybe not eating, uh, you know, 40 bananas a day or something like that, like, you know, Freely and some of the other people recommend. But I mean, certainly the, you know, we hear countless things about the brown rice and the oats and the, you know, the lentils and the other legumes uh, as being healthy sources of protein and mm -hmm. moderate complex carbohydrates. Uh, so but despite that, still having issues there. So um, now I've seen, you know, you've talked about I mean, you know, I'm sure you've you've sort of modified things. You've come along in this kind of meat based diet. So when you switched, when you made that decision to switch over, was it? Did you go keto first? Did you do paleo? I mean, how did or did you just jump straight into carnivore? How did that happen? I jumped straight in because uh, during those last few days few weeks of being vegan, I was obsessively just researching about how to be prepared for the carnivore diet because I just wanted to go straight in, no more plants, no more carbs, sugars. Um, so I was prepared to just do the carnivore diet. And I did that overnight. I just started the carnivore diet. How, how was that transition? And, and before you before you answer, I mean, a lot of people would say, well, that's just nuts. I mean, why go from one extreme to the other? Why, why not do a balanced diet? Why not do, uh, you know, you know, why not do the balanced diet thing? I mean, what, what mm -hmm. was the, what was the rationale for doing that? Because we see it all the time. We see people saying, "Hey, these carnivore people, you're crazy. Why don't you? What's wrong with eating some fruits and vegetables?" And a lot, and most of us have said, "Well, we did that already. I mean, we yeah. tried the fruits and vegetables and the balanced diet and the paleo and the keto with lots of spinach and and broccoli and avocado and berries. I mean, we all did that. I mean, it's yeah. not like we haven't tried that before. So, yeah. But so why didn't you? What was the decision to say, "Hey, I'm I'm just going to like many vegans. It's like I'm going to have an egg." Or I'm going to have right. a little bite of fish because I think fish are less sentient than cows or whatever. But I mean, you just made a decision, hey, I'm just going to go start eating steaks, which is, I think, uh, yep. you know, I mean, I, I think probably quite honestly, it's probably, a, in, in, I mean, obviously in retrospect, it's, it seems to be working. Yes. But was there any kind of thought like maybe I'm just going to tap my toes, dip my toes in the water or just, you just kind of jumped in head first in the deep water? Yeah, sure. So. I kind of already had this feeling that I didn't need this middle ground, this slow transition, because I was raised off of just vegetables and meat, uh, just moderation and everything. My mom is a huge advocate of moderation, you know, a little bit of everything. And I already saw the experience and how I felt um, growing up eating those things. So I was just, also my personality is just very extreme. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it fully, 100% committed. So the carnivore diet was just so convincing to me. And I saw all of these success stories, these transformations. Kelly Hogan was a huge inspiration to me before I went in. Um, and uh, of course, I was open to the idea, okay, let's say I crave, I'm craving some berries or vegetables. I was open to eating some, but I never did. All I wanted was more beef, uh, more butter, and more eggs. My first meal was just some lightly scrambled eggs, like two eggs with some butter. So I wasn't forcing my body to just jump and eat, eating a bunch of steaks. It was a, a slow, gradual um you know, introduction to animal foods again, uh, but I did not crave or want any plant foods anymore. Okay. And so how was the transition? Did you immediately feel better? Did you, were there some energy issues? How did you deal with that? Yeah. So the transition, I think the biggest issue of me doing carnivore just overnight was the digestion. Um, I think I may have 
started gorging on too much fat. Yes, my body wanted it, but I don't think my stomach was ready to digest all of that. So that the digestion was a, a like a long process, lots of diarrhea. Um, mostly it was just loose stools and unexpected trips to the bathroom. Uh, I made a video on my YouTube channel sharing my insight and what helped me. I learned a lot. So obviously the fat was one of the biggest causes of the loose stools, but I feel like eating more raw fats is more helpful to prevent any diarrhea, any cooked fats, render fats, like super fatty broths uh, really triggered the loose stools. Um, besides the diarrhea, it was just the insatiable hunger that I felt, which was okay because I didn't restrict or I didn't, um, you know, count calories and try to keep a skinny weight. Still, I told myself that I'm just going to go all in. If I gain weight, it's fine. And I gained weight, but I made sure that I stayed satiated. Yeah, that's something that, you know, I had said early, you know, I, I sometimes I regret saying this, but I mean, I, I still think it holds up true. I say, when people transition, you know, I would say, you know, eat, eat like it, eat meat like it's your job because many people do. They, they come from this county, calorie counting restriction background. And while ultimately, and I will say this over and over again, a caloric intake will have an impact. I mean, I think it's clear that it does. I mean, obviously, there's things that drive satiety and appetite regulation and, and, you know, how much heat we expend and stuff like that. But in the beginning, I think it's important to really do that to deal with those cravings because, you know, many people on plant-based diets are constantly eating. I mean, there's eat, 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 eat all day long to maintain yes. blood sugar. Um, but some people take that as I'm going to, I'm going to eat past satiety for the rest of my life. And then they gain weight. I'm like, well, that's not exactly my intent there. But so I know you, and I kind of saw in a video, you said I was just eating like sticks of butter, yep. you know, and just really eating just gorging, basically gorging on fat, yes. which I, you know, personally, I'm not sure that's a long-term solution, particularly if it puts you in this super high caloric excess. Mm -hmm. But tell me about that sort of issue, because I, th I think that's an interesting concept. And I think it's, and, and you know, how long have you been on the diet and where are you at from then, you know, from where you transitioned to where, what you're kind of like now on a daily basis? Yeah, so I'm 22, almost 23 months. I started the carnivore diet actually on New Year's Day as a New Year's resolution just to improve my health, finally. Um, so 22 months and I, for the fat, gorging on the fat, I was just craving it so, so badly. Um, and I was gorging on it and, because it just made me feel better. It like I couldn't really focus on anything because all I would be thinking is, oh, I want more butter, like I want more eggs. Um, so I kind of just stopped denying my body from the amount of food that it needed uh, because like I always wanted to stay thin. And during the vegan diet, I was definitely malnourished and restricting a lot. So the carnivore diet, I just ate whenever I was hungry. Um, so was I in a caloric surplus? Definitely because I gained a lot of weight, but also I feel like my metabolism was just really slow. Um, it slowed down and my hormones were a wreck because I didn't have my period. Um, so I just felt like if I fed my body what it was craving and just I fed it enough nutrients and calories, I would at least be able to focus on school. I would at least be able to just practice and not think about the food. Yeah, I, I interviewed, I think two days ago, Elizabeth Bright, who wrote a book about menopause and fats and saying, you know, it is important. You know, fats are important. And it, it's not that yeah. I'm saying we should be on a low fat diet by any means. Uh, you know, I just think there's a, there's a, you know, I, I think there's a point. I think that point varies a little bit from people. And I think particularly early on, um, you know, you may be that way because you probably undernourished yourself for so long, particularly probably with regard to fats, especially. And, you know, you might have, been at a place where I like the number on the scale or whatever, but yeah. you know, if you're not functioning well, it doesn't do much good. And, you know, I think there's that point where you just have to restore that nourishment that you've been missing for so long to kind of get those hormone levels kind of normalized, or at least that functional, you know, the function of the hormones, which mm -hmm. is more important to normalize. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, so I want to ask you about the, the, 
So I guess piano and violin, are you, are you equally proficient at both of those? Are you both, are both of those things you're considering at a professional level? Yeah, I started both instruments around the same time and I've studied both equally, uh, intensely pretty much my whole life. Um, although I do feel like my piano, um, is something that I'm more passionate about. If I were to choose one, I would always choose piano. But both, I feel like, is very much a huge part of my life. Yeah, I see the piano in the background, I think. Yeah, that's a piano. That. <laughs> um, let me ask you about, so let's talk about that. Have you noticed with a change in diet, has that impacted your musical ability, your ability to concentrate and play, and or, you know anything that, that would go into being a, good, a musician? Absolutely. I think diet and uh, just mental function and capacity is very much related, um, especially when you're a classical musician. So I always feel like for classical music, it's just that much more rigorous because it's a lot of isolated practice. You're in a practice room just drilling away, learning new notes, memorizing the notes. And I know Brett can understand he's practicing his guitar as he's watching. Um, it's just a lot of focus and dedication commitment. And if you're not like 100% clear of what you want to practice each day, it's hard to keep up with all of the other musicians in this industry. It's a very competitive uh, career. However, you know, I was very much uh, stressed and affected by this whole idea of, oh, there's all these competitors. I'm not the best. But after like healing my mental health with good diet, it's kind of fascinating how my outlook on who I am as a musician and what this career is all about has completely changed. I no longer uh, face my career as something that I have to be better at. I have to be at the top. Instead, I realize that I am unique because firstly, I can play two instruments and also because I'm just confident in what I have to say through my music. It's a lot about your confidence, you know? Um, Everybody has something to say through their music, but if you can be convincing with the way you perform, with what you are playing, how you're delivering your performance, that is so important. So I've realized that after eating meat. So something happened in my brain. Yeah, I remember, and I, I forget the name of the movie. I'm sure you've, you've seen it there, but it had, and I'm blanking on the, name, you know, the actor too, but there was a guy in Australia that, you know, he was a, you know, his father pushed him like a maniac to be a musician and then he went nuts. And then like he wandered into a bar and started playing like Flight of the Bumblebee or something like that really impressively. Yeah. And I don't, but I mean, obviously there's a mental health side of that. And there's people that did just push so hard that yes. I guess it can really stress. It can really break lot, you. you know? Yes. There are too many yeah. of my classmates, yeah. you know, that I've seen who kind of just like the pressure and the stress really breaks a musician. Um, uh, yeah. And also it's just a lot of um, the resilience to the pressure and being on stage in front of all of those people playing live one mistake and you will be scrutinized, you know, why do we have to be so stressed? It's just a performance. So it's a lot of just, I guess, looking at a performance as something to enjoy, not something to dread. And that's something that, kind of changed when I started feeding my body and brain the right nutrients. And also I'm able to memorize pieces quicker. So like my brain is just definitely healthier now. Yeah. Has, I mean, do you play as part of a group? I mean, are you in, in like a concert uh, group or anything like that where people can tell, or is that something that? Uh... Um, so for piano, it's a lot of solo playing for violin. Um, I, sometimes playing orchestras here and there, but I also just prefer to play solo and play with my boyfriend as he'll be accompanying me and I'm just on violin. Yeah, I'm trying to look up the name of that dang movie. I know Jeffrey yeah. Rush was a, was the, uh, I guess, the actor in it, but uh, or the adult part of the actor. But anyway, I'll figure it out here. Mm -hmm. um, do you... Um, well, I mean, let, let's go into <laughs> just for my own self interest or greediness. Tell me about this, this egg pudding because this is a, I guess, this is a, maybe more of a Chinese based dish. 
I wow. actually made it yesterday, basically following your recipe. Oh. And still, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think I had some issue with water falling back into the thing. And I've seen some people say uh -huh. that you, know, you cover, cover it with foil. Tell, tell us about the little egg custard pudding or egg pudding, as you call it, just for fun. Yeah, egg pudding in Chinese, it's called zheng ji dan, which basically translates to steamed egg. So it's like a steamed type of egg dish where it turns into pudding because you add some broth, water, whatever liquid you want in the bowl, the egg mixture, you beat it up and you immerse it in some water and just steam it. So it becomes a pudding. And I shared it because it's been something that I've been eating like my whole life since I was a kid. My mom would make it for breakfast every day before school. And I just thought I would share it because it's so perfect. You could make it 100% carnivore eggs and water. And that's how I shared it initially. And it just blew up because I guess people started realizing they could be creative by making it into a dessert style or something with some bacon crisps, crisps on top or ground beef. You really can add whatever you want. Um, um, and uh, the the you you mentioned that there was water that dripped out of the bowl. That probably is because you. Well, I think it was you know because I because I covered it with a lid and I think the steam sort of went on the lid and then it fell back into the into the into the into the egg mixture. You know. I see. So I always like to crack the lid a little bit so all that steam can kind of leave the pot instead of going in the bowl. But a lot of um, a lot of my followers will tell me that it's it takes a lot of practice, and I think it does. My mom made it for me my whole life, so it took a lot of practice for me to learn and share. Um, but it really is just uh, knowing your ratios because every egg pudding is different. Mostly, it works with one to one ratio. Yeah, you're talking water to eggs, and I saw you. I, I actually watched your video where you you know you measured you, you cracked the eggs and you saw how much volume you got, and then you just added an equal amount of volume, you scrambled, whipped it up, and then, you know, put it in the dish and put it in the water bath, basically, and let it go. And I, you know, I, I did yeah. that. I also tried it with, uh, I think I used some milk or some cream, because I yeah. got some beer and wine, and that was also pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I think it does take a while to perfect, even though it's a simple, and this is what I read, it was like, even though these things are super simple ingredients, it, it can be challenging. You got to know how to do it just right. And that's yeah. the thing is. Yeah, the ingredients are simple. The it's mostly the technique um, that's that needs some practice. Yeah, yeah, I have to <laughs> practice because I like I, I enjoy doing some of that stuff. We got all these kind of crazy cooking things that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you about um, so psoriasis, eczema, better. I assume the 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 uh, you know. Do you, I mean, because you're, you're doing the piano, you're doing the violin, um, and you've got, uh, I think, of you know, like I said, I've got a YouTube video channel that, you know, I, I, I get in there talk and stuff, and it's not very well, there's not much production value, but you've got a really, I think, pretty fun one that's uh, well produced and a lot of good <laughs> content. I think it's good information for a lot of people. What has been some of the topics that you've enjoyed or had the most sort of success with, or maybe most controversial ones that you've talked about? Um, I really like to do uh, what I eat in a day. I feel like those are very simple and eye-opening for people just to get an idea of what one can eat on the carnivore diet. And I, I like to share some tips on how to be on a budget or how to be able to transition or carnivore for beginners tips. Um, and the video about poop, I like to be just open, transparent, and <laughs> hopefully help newcomers or people who are interested. I also like to address that I used to be vegan and I'm very welcoming and um, happy to help any vegans or vegetarians who are curious about incorporating meat again in their diet. And I get messages like those every day asking, hey, Bella, can you please help me uh, understand why eating meat is good? Because I really want to try it. I really am craving it. You know, things like that. And so I realized my YouTube channel can be like a supplement to help these people out there who want to give carnivore diet a try or at least even keto carnivore. Um, so it's just mostly to supplement my content on Instagram. Yeah, and I, and I think that's, again, I and this is, you know, I, I continuously try to promote this within this community and to some degree in my social medias. You know, we, we're, 
we don't necessarily say that you, you know, got to be a hundred percent carnivore to be healthy. It's not that all vegetables are poisons, it's not that all carbohydrates are poisons, yes, right? But there are some people that just do better without them, and I think we just need to recognize that and figure out why that is and, and support those people that do that. But you know, there's other people that are happy to do a mostly meat based diet or you know, whatever, and they do fine with that. Um, let me ask you about that because as a you know, uh, a vegan, ex vegan, there are a lot of people that sort of really would say, well, how do you, how do you come to terms with the ethical side or any other sort of non nutritional sides of justifying why you would, you know, eat, I, you know, I just had a person, you know, I, I get, I get sent stuff to me every day from thousands of people. I'm they sure. send me stuff every, every single vegan event or, you know, <laughs> that comes out in the, in the, in the news or the paper, I will get, 50 people send me the same message. I mean, it's like, okay, 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 okay. But yeah. there was a gal that just said, you know, uh, I think killing uh, killing an animal and eating it is worse than, is worse than killing chill, human children, which I, I just don't understand that. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's an interesting perspective, one I would I just don't get. But yeah. uh, I'm assuming this person is not a mother or anything like that, or they'd never say that, would be my guess. But how do you justify the fact that, you know, you were probably saying that, you know, eating animals is cruel and, you know, I'm, I'm you know, if there's no animals on my plate, then I'm, I'm completely guilt-free or something along that, which ultimately, you know, I know that's not true, mm -hmm. but how do you, how do you, how do you justify your, and I don't think, you, to, to be clear, I don't think we need to justify the fact that we eat meat as human beings. We've been doing it forever, but yes. there will be people that will ask you to do that, particularly as a, as a, people that are vegans or, or soon to be ex-vegans or wanting to consider leaving veganism. What, what do you talk about with that? Yeah, by now, I just truly believe that it's like the circle of life. These animals have sacrificed their beautiful life so they can give us the nutrients to be happy, healthy, and to live our life to the fullest. And on top of that, I really buy meats uh, who from, that are ethically raised and that have had a great life, that have had the freedom to roam pastures. And those types of meats, I feel like are, you know, it, you should not be feeling guilty to eat meats that are raised that certain way. And when you are able to eat these meats and feel so happy and so nourished, there should not be these concerns and questions about it being evil. Um, I think these vegans can be so, so dramatic and they can blow everything out of pro proportion. They love to spread hate. So I just try to ignore that and instead focus on how I can live my happiest life and how I can be the most productive and how I can make an impact on this world. That's all I care about. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I mean, I, I don't think we all have to be environmental activists. I mean, I, I just, you know, I think, you know, some people just can be happy people raising, you know, raising their children, living their lives and without having to have an agenda or something like that. I think there's, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and even if you decide, hey, I, I care about the environment, I want to make a difference. There's many, many ways you can do that. It doesn't have to be through a dietary choice. And I know these people that are hell bent on convincing everybody that, you know, you by eating animals is the worst thing you could possibly do. Well, there's just so much evidence to show that that's not the biggest thing that's driving climate change or whatever you want to you want to say about that let me ask you about uh you know and i don't know how much ingrained you are with the chinese culture if you know your parents were, came from there or yes. grew up there or, or whatever, if you go back there how is meat eating viewed in in those countries i mean i know when i visited asia recently mm -hmm. i mean it seems like it is eat everything and moves but <laughs> <laughs> Is there some sort of stigma around eating types of meat? I mean, some countries like pork is off limits. Obviously, China, it's not. Pork is the number one eaten sure. animal in the world, hands yeah. down. I mean, it, most people don't realize that because most Asians eat pork. And, and you know, yes. so we see that. Chicken is probably approaching it now. But is there some stigma to meat eating it being bad in any way in, in China or other parts of Asia to where? No, so I was actually born in China, in Shenzhen, China, and I, my mom 
brought me and my siblings to America when I was three for a better education. But I have a very close relationship with my parents because I visit them in China and they always take me around the city. My mom is from Shandong. My dad is from Henan, just rural areas. And、um, experiencing life there, eating the cuisine there, it's very meat heavy. They love incorporating beef, pork, chicken in their dishes. My mom would be cooking these dishes for me growing up. So she Truly believes that meat is good for health.、Um, she was pissed when I went vegan those six years, and she was so happy that I started eating meat again. And also, there's this huge thing for hot pot, which is completely centered around meat. You basically have this pot of boiling water or broth, and you just dip raw meats and eat it.、Uh, socialize. It's it's a great way to eat and socialize. So meat is a huge part of Chinese cuisine, and whenever. I go there. Everybody just loves to talk about, you know, meat is skin food.、Uh, Asians love that glowy, glassy skin. Koreans are obsessed with eating meat, meat organs, you know, pig blood. That's all believed to help our skin glow more. Yeah, I, I just well, it was a year ago. I guess I was in Malaysia, and I I had the the, the opportunity and the pleasure to to be taken around by this. Uh, a woman that was from China, living in Malaysia, but you know,、uh-huh. obviously very close to the culture. And we went out to eat, you know, one of the restaurants. And I mean, it was literally, you know, meat dish after meat dish after meat dish. I mean, I ate <laughs> jellyfish, which I was like, wow, you、oh, yeah. eat jellyfish, which I was like, I, I was blown away. I didn't know, I didn't know how edible jellyfish were, and they were very crunchy, which I thought was、oh. sort of unusual, you know, considering you call them jellyfish, but they're actually their tentacles、mm-hmm. are. Crunchy, apparently, you know. <laughs> so、yeah. I was surprised about that. Yeah, but I mean, and but the you know the images that you know, and it may be, maybe it's due to some of the in, in impoverished regions that you know it's the, the the traditional belief is you know in in China and other parts of Asia you'll get a little tiny piece of meat, a whole bunch of vegetables, and then a mountain of rice.、Hmm. Uh, that has been. This, this sort of perception is that is there is that accurate or what is what is the actual thing that's going on? I would say, I guess it depends on your preference in what you prefer to eat at that dining table. But it's a it's a lot of like you know the spinning round tables where you can just get whatever you prefer.、Um, of course. A bowl of rice is served in front of everyone sitting around that table, and on the spinning part, there's a lot of vegetables. There's a lot of meats, just meat dishes, and a lot of meat mixed with vegetables. So I think meat is half, plants are half, and the rice is kind of just an addition if you want it or not. Yeah, I mean, I've seen some recent epidemi- again epidemiologic studies, which I always sort of demonize. But I mean, they they are showing showing associative data with high high rate rice con- consumption in different parts of Asia, Southeast Asia, including countries like Vietnam, China, that are so- showing if you eat a ton of rice, they're more likely to become diabetic. And so,、mm-hmm. even though there is some amount of it in the in the culture. It's、yeah. probably not the people that are gorging on rice. There's probably more of a balance there. So、yeah. your parents were mortified at you going vegan. What about you going carnivore? Are they like, wait a minute, you're just as crazy? <laughs> at first, my mom just didn't believe that I'm only eating meats. But then I, when I visited her in China, and she took me to hot pot restaurants, she would start noticing that I don't order any vegetables, and she would just start asking, "Oh, why, why don't you eat vegetables anymore?" And I just tell her I feel best without the vegetables. I feel great. Like, can't you see? You know, my skin issues are gone. She does notice these things, and I can tell that she's becoming more and more convinced and accepting,、uh, much more. Accepting than when I was vegan, so I don't have a hard time with her, convincing her to、uh, eat more meat. You know, whereas when I was vegan, she just wouldn't even take it or listen to what I had to say about the vegan diet. Yeah, I think you know, and this is something you know, as we have this MeetRx platform, you know, I think that、uh, Asia is just a huge, huge market for people doing a carnivore diet. I mean, obviously.、Mm. China, you've already got the acceptance of you know, meat as being a part of a healthy diet,、uh, and there are some people as we're seeing more and more diabetics in China, more and more obesity, more and more heart disease, things that traditionally weren't there. That may be something that people are willing to at least pursue. And the same thing, I think, with, surprisingly, with India, India is another country. You know, they've got they're almost they're pretty much on par with China with population. They're both 
earning about 1.4 billion. I think India will surpass China by about 2030 for the most populous country. Sorry for those people that are <laughs> for the Chinese that are going to say they're number one in the population. But the same thing with India, despite the fact that many are vegetarian, despite the fact that uh, cows are sacred, there is still a lot of opportunity to eat meat in India, whether it's goat, lamb, chicken, seafood, you know, eggs, so on and so forth. Certainly have a huge dairy history. Um, let me ask you this. Um, what about... Uh, dairy in your personal experience are you someone that can do dairy or do you avoid dairy ah uh, dairy so i uh love raw dairy so raw cheeses are great i don't find i get uh, any inflammation in my eczema when i have raw dairy um something else that i love is kefir raw kefir so these two products dairy products are a great like way to indulge a little bit and enjoy dairy products. I just do think that raw makes a difference. Yeah. A lot of people will say that, you know, and I think, you know, I think the only caveat I'd say is you, you know, you just have to be careful with sourcing because there are, yeah. you know, there are some illnesses that occur, you know, and we see that, that, you know, dairy in general does not cause a lot of illnesses in the U S um, you know, there's, there's a handful every year where there's people that get hospitalized. There are, the ratio of, of those coming from raw is a little bit higher. So, it, you know, it's, but I mean, the numbers are so, so are really, really low. So it's like getting struck by lightning. You know, you might, you know, maybe eating raw, you might get struck by lightning twice as often as you do eating homogenized, but the numbers are still pretty low. And so it's one of those things that you and Kelsey's accurately pointing out that lettuce probably kills more than dairy for sure. Uh, I would mm -hmm. say, yes, that's true. Um, interesting, you know, and I'll talk about this just because I just brought this up. We see much more foodborne illnesses in vegetables and fruits and other plant products than we do in meat. However, when you get an infection from meat, it often tends to be more severe. And so some of the more severe infections mm. associated with meat. So again, all these the people that are raw food advocates, I just say, just be very cautious about your sourcing. You know, if, if, if it doesn't kill you to put a quick sear on something, yeah. That would be my, my suggestion. And I should have said, you know, steak and butter girl, obviously butter is, you know, <laughs> right, right. Dairy. So yeah. I, mean, I, I guess I could have deduced that from your name, but I mean, I just, <laughs> but it is interesting because we do see people that, you know, even a raw dairy, they can't do. And then there's, there's certainly this dichotomy. Some people say, no, it's because you, raw dairy is the greatest. And, you know, and, so in, in what state do you live? Are you in New York still? Because I'm just wondering where you can access raw dairy. Cause there's, yeah. yeah, I'm in New York City now, so it is illegal. I can't really find any raw dairy besides raw cheese. Whole Foods carries a great selection of raw cheese, but the raw kefir, it's kind of hard to find unless you order kind of under the table from local farms and they kind of do a drop ship or they can just um, ship directly to your address. Um, but actually, I checked online and many times they're out of stock. So it's pretty high demand. Uh, but when I was in Los Angeles with family, uh, there is this brand called Organic Pastures where they sell at Sprouts grocery stores. It's raw dairy, raw milk, raw cream, raw kefir. So I was drinking a lot of their raw kefir in LA. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. And there's some, there, I think the closest place to me that sells raw dairy products is a, is a, is a, uh, local chain restaurant called mothers in Southern California. So people in Southern California might be familiar with it, hmm. but it is, I mean, literally it's like a vegan. I mean, you can't eat, I don't think you can buy meat in that store. I mean, and there's a little cafe and it was kind of funny about four years ago. I used to go there regularly and I would eat, hmm. and it wasn't V I'd say it would be vegetarian. Cause I would always get the, uh, it was eggs and beans and rice and a little bit of hot sauce and some avocados or, or whatever bowl. I can't remember. I used to eat the heck out of that stuff. I see. Uh, but I was look. I was I was looking to try some raw dairy because I really hadn't tried it, uh, you know. And I I found some there, and I had some raw cream, and, and you know, use it. And you know, I honestly I didn't. I was I didn't really notice a difference in doing mm -hmm. these things. Again, but I, I I don't think I had a, you know, a major major issue with dairy. Occasionally, I sometimes I have a little bit of things, but for the most part, I'm okay with that. Mm. Um. What is so? Are you said you're you're about to graduate from Juilliard? And, I already graduated. Oh, sorry, you already graduated. <laughs> and so, what is the uh, what is the plan? Are you going to stay in New York City? Um, 
what does the immediate future look like for you? So I was originally going to go to London and study violin, a second master's in violin at the Royal Academy of Music. Um, but they gave me an update right before school started that everything will still be virtual, yet I still have to move to London and be there in person. And that wasn't very a good situation for me. So I decided to take a break from school, take a gap year, and have some time to think if I still want to continue education. Um, if I were to, I would apply for a doctorate. I would just want to do a doctorate degree um, in piano performance. But that's still something I'm thinking about. But I do know for sure that during this whole pandemic, staying at home and uh, giving YouTube a try, it's kind of life-changing because I see how big um, the audience is on YouTube, uh, where people are actually curious and willing to learn about this way of living and eating, where I feel like if I kind of made this more uh, just a bigger part of my life, making content on YouTube, spreading the word about the carnivore diet. I feel like that's something that I would be completely happy and passionate about doing. So I'm kind of in this predicament wondering if I should just become a YouTuber. Like that's my dream now. <laughs> also, classical music is kind of not alive when live performances are just not happening. So I'm kind of shifting my focus on content creating. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess the only caution I have with YouTube is it's, it's very capricious. And I mean, you know, if, if they decide that they don't like your content, that's true. They shut down your channel. I mean, and they can and they do that and have done that. And I, you know, I know like currently, like like on Instagram, I can't do Instagram lives right now. It's been sh my, my oh, wow. been shut down. So yeah. I don't know if it was an error or if they decided, hey, we don't like you talking about meat and and just decided to shut that down. And my YouTube has been shadow man multiple times. And so oh, wow. it's, it's something that you just have to, you know, you just have to realize that, you know, maybe there's, you can't rely on that as, as much right. as you think you can. You yeah. Can, and that's, and I mean, some things may go out of vogue after three or four years. And so yeah. um, I just, you know, I'm, you know, I, uh, I mean, I think it's really neat that you're able to do that with the, with the musical stuff. Mm. Um, do you? Um, oh, so I remember the movie was called Shine. Somebody put it. In, somebody put it in the comments. Shine. Oh. Jeffrey Rush. Uh, oh, I have to yeah, watch that. Yeah, watch it. It's 1996. Very good movie. But he got he went nuts playing this piece called the Rachmaninoff Seven. I don't know oh. if you're familiar with that piece. If it's hard or something. Yes, I'm guessing it's the concerto. <laughs> I don't, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, that drove him nuts. Like he, like, wow. he, like he tried to perfect it. He couldn't. And he ended up like just going off the deep end and turned up, you know, like drugs and alcohol for like 30 years and came yep. wandering. And I can't remember the guy's name, the actors, the actor was Jeffrey Rush, but the character he was playing. And I just, I think I just had it here a second ago. Um, it was David Helfgott was the name of the uh, pianist who was, uh, you know, the guy that, uh, you know, he went to London for a musical scholarship and then. Oh, wow. Went at it. So, so it's interesting. You might enjoy that movie. I thought it was pretty good. I enjoy it. I'm, you know, I think Jeffrey Rush is a good actor and I'm not a, I'm not a musician guy, but it was something I thought was really, really worth seeing. So That's awesome. I'm going to watch it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, David Health got yeah. So Elizabeth Bright knows that. So, so if you might, if you you know while you're locked in doing the coronavirus between egg custard things, what other dishes you got out there for us that you can tell us about? Anything else that's uh, yeah. Carnivorous? So I always ask my mom for ideas, and she recently taught me how to make uh, her pork jelly. It's basically pork skin jelly. Um, you use the pork skin and you cut it up, you boil it and you chill it and it becomes this jelly. So I love sharing uh, Chinese inspired uh, carnivore dishes. So, so far, a lot of people love making the egg pudding, of course, but the pork skin jelly is great. Um, and then I do a lot of easy just idiot proof recipes. So uh, the carnivore muffins where you kind of shape a, a cup with the uh, ground beef or organ blend and then you pour the egg in the middle of the cup and then you bake it and that becomes like this really cute carnivore muffin with an egg middle. So it's just a lot of easy creative recipes. Still going to come out with more but I'm waiting for my mom to give me an idea. <laughs> 
Yeah, what about pork belly? I mean, that seems to be, I think That's most great. people would concede that, that, that the Chinese have sort of perfected that. I mean, it seems like it's a process. So, you know, to, you know, prepare the skin and, you know, dehydrate it and salt prime it. And do you do it? Do you, are you into pork belly and making those the traditional way? Yeah, the traditional way, it's called hong shao rou, and it is very, very heavily uh, seasoned with soy sauce and tons of sugar. So um, the only way to make it work is to, I guess, season it with some salt and maybe uh, broil in bone broth. So it's not really the same taste, but pork belly on its own is great. It's super fatty and delicious. So I like to either air fry it or just boil it. I do a lot of boiling. So just hot pot style. And I feel like meat tastes great when it's lightly boiled. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I've just, done another, if there's restaurants, you know, that you do that and you just kind of sit there and they just kind of bring out their meat and you just kind of Yes, it's you know, so much fun. It's, it's just a fun. It's just a fun sort of way to do it. By the way, yeah. I think it's pretty cool. Is mm -hmm. there? Are there? Uh, you know, the the boiling because sometimes they boil it in water, but other times it's in a broth. Is that how you do it in yeah. different broths? Right. I make sure that I request uh, just water, and sometimes they don't. They think I'm crazy because it's so traditional to use some broth or some type of soup base. But I always say, please, just water. I don't want any seasoning. Not even one green onion in there. Just water, and they can do it as long as you tell them. And I'm just curious, you know, you know, some people would say, hey, well, that sounds pretty extreme. Do you need to do that? And it, is it something that have you found, I mean, 22 months in now, have you experimented with reincorporating other types of food? Have you had a desire to do that? What has been, you know, what has been the situation with that? Yeah, like, no, I don't really want to incorporate any plant foods at the moment. I don't have this craving to try. Um, there have been times where I go visit my boyfriend's place and her mom, his mom will cook some dishes and she makes it carnivore. But sometimes she'll accidentally add some green onions. And just by eating those tiny little things, I'll usually spit it out. But I do notice a difference. My eczema is flared up again. So if I could avoid inflammation at all costs, I will do anything to do that um, because my eczema can be very painful. I just don't want to bleed anymore. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I mean, I, I don't think anyone would criticize you for that. I mean, I, and I certainly don't. I just, you know, that, but there are people that, 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 you know, that aren't familiar with this sort of situation. They'll say, that just sounds crazy. And, you know, how why would a molecule of this or that or a piece of onion make you that sick and for some people it just does and that's mm -hmm. just the way it is and mm -hmm. i think we just have to realize that and you know maybe there'll be something that my hope is that we kind of sort some of these things out as we continue to grow this community and we get more and more data and more input and that's something that we are you know and meet our ex actively working on getting that happening you know and it's just it's just, it just takes time. It takes a lot of input and it takes a lot of data and, and, you know, we can kind of figure some of these differences out. And I think that's ultimately we'll be able to help a lot of people with this. Um, what, uh, let me ask you, so steak and butter gal, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so steak and butter gal. <laughs> Uh, and that's your YouTube channel. Is that, is that, is that, is that where you go? Is that, do you have other social media? I mean, I, I guess there's a Instagram more. Yeah. Uh, Instagram, YouTube, uh, both steak and butter gal spelled out. Um, and I like to share my music on a separate Instagram profile called Opus Bella. So B E L uh, O P U S Opus, like Opus number for music, Bella, B-E-L-L-A. -L -L -A. I always post some Beethoven, Chopin, whatever music people request just to help everybody enjoy some music, classical music in their life. Um, but yeah, YouTube and Instagram, my main profiles are Steak and Butter Gal. And just because somebody asked, uh, they wanted to know how, how often and how long do you practice your music? Okay, so when I'm in the thick of it, like I have concerts and competitions, I'll be practicing at least six hours a day um, on each instrument. So <laughs> when I have to do both in one day, of course, I have to cut the time. It's a lot of uh, multi multitasking and knowing how to practice efficiently. I find that's how I can keep up both instruments. But on a daily basis, it's two to three hours, I would say. And I always take days off where I can just 
clear my mind and not think about music. I think that's very healthy. Yeah, and and I assume you. I mean, I assume you still enjoy it. I mean, is, is it? Of course. Enjoy it I mean, because I mean, is there some sort of endorphin? rush that happens when you absolutely you there's nothing right. yeah there's nothing that can compare to that adrenaline uh rush when you step on stage and you just perform in front of an audience i really miss that that's honestly the, the one thing that i love most about classical music and performing is the live performing so i miss that a lot um but i find doing the videos and sharing through virtually is is the second best but performing is why i love uh music yeah, it's interesting with not to knock other forms of music, but that classical music is called classical music for a reason because it's yeah. it never goes away. I mean, it's always timeless. Good, yeah. it's timeless. Do you have a favorite or a couple of favorite, uh, you know, uh, composers that you think that you like to, yes. to follow the most? Who do you like the most? My top favorite, hands down, is Beethoven, Ludwig van Beethoven. I just I love his temperament in his music and his brilliance in just making the notes come alive through the way he harmonizes, through the way he develops through each sonata. I think his music is just the best. <laughs> um, it's considered quite, it's considered classical era. So within classical music, there's different genres like romantic, uh, which is Chopin, Rachmaninoff, Tchaikovsky. It's very much centered around emotions and uh, love and romance and passion. But classical music is almost like, um, you know, lots of passion, but still very uh, serious, you know. And then there's Baroque music, Bach, Mozart, which is very old school and just very proper, that I find is the most difficult to play. But Beethoven, I feel like it's just my second nature to be able to play because you all you need to do is know the notes, play what he says on the score, and put some passion. Yeah, when you're, I guess, you know, I mean, I guess you're, obviously these different concerts, you know, you know choirs, and, and uh, I'm not blanking on the name right now, but. Yeah, you know, the, the big concert, you know, classical music con concert, you know, uh, orchestras. Uh, yeah. And I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I don't know which is considered the best or the best. You know, there's probably a handful of whatever, whatever is considered the best, the London Symphony or, you know, whatever. I mean, there's something in there. It's again, I'm totally out of my depth, <laughs> not in my field. I'm, I'm more comfortable talking about sports or anything like that or medicine <laughs> or nutrition, but um when you know like you say do you, you i mean you audition for these i assume and then they say i mean do you know like ahead of time what pieces you'd be playing like mm -hmm. what you're auditioning for mm -hmm. or do they just say and then and then you say i really don't like those type of songs or music and i'm not going to bother with those guys is that is that there's some degree of you you know what you're getting into before you sign up or apply Absolutely, yes. So for competitions where you purely just compete uh, for uh, like a place, like first place, second place, third place, the jury will give you guidelines. They'll give you some freedom, but they'll require, okay, we need at least 30 minutes worth of repertoire where uh, you need at least one piece in Baroque, one piece in Classical, and one piece in Romantic. Well, within those small sections, you have a bunch of composers to choose from. So you do have freedom, but at the same time, you still have to fit within some requirements. But for example, like my Juilliard School audition for Masters, they have quite strict guidelines. You need a Chopin etude because Chopin etudes will, you know, show them your technique, how good it is. You need a sonata, classical sonata, so Beethoven sonata. You need a big romantic work, and you need a, a contemporary piece. So they like to see just how well you can play across the board in different genres. And I do think that's important for classical musicians to be able to play all of the di these different styles and genres of music well. Of course, there are also musicians who only specialize in modern contemporary music or just Beethoven. So it's it, there's a lot of freedom unless you want to do competitions all your life. Yeah, and for, for playing in these uh, big symphonies, um, you know, with two instruments, you know, and they mm. were obviously very different instruments with the violin and the piano. I mean, is it, it, I guess it would not be conceivable that you would be picked for both instruments for the same symphony because you can't be in two places at once, I, I suppose. But yeah. I mean, if you, if you like say, hey, I want to join this particular group, 
A guy would assume violin is probably because there's only there's usually yeah one, that's the several violinists yeah that's a the that's the big bonus of playing violin is that you can have more opportunities it's definitely true for violin you can do orchestras you can do chamber groups um, whereas piano it's very much centered around solo just doing it on your own unless you are an accompaniment a collaborative pianist or if you want to do chamber music but that's usually groups less than five six people but violin you have lots of opportunities to join orchestras so um yeah, that's the biggest difference. More opportunities for string players. One final question. Do you play uh, music outside of classical music? Do you ever play like pop or any of that stuff just to, just to goof around? Or yeah, I love doing that. On Instagram, I play a lot of uh, pop songs, like covers. It's really fun. It's, I, do, I do love doing that, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, wonderful. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, Steak and Butter Gal, Instagram, YouTube, um, and the music was Opus. Yeah, O P U S Opus Bella, B E L L A. Opus Bella, right? Okay, yes. so great. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been fun. Um, I look forward to uh, hearing some more of your music. I, you know, feel free to tag me on that stuff. I always enjoy it. I think sure, it's fun. Thank you. That, and uh, look forward to learning some more of the recipes because I think it's really neat to see all the different cultural takes on the carnivore diet, and we have so many great cultures out there that can probably continue yeah. to contribute to this and make it more, you know, for those people that like a little more variety, I, you know, I can go months to see eating steaks and I'm happy, but sometimes yeah, me too. you're like, yeah, hey, I'll do something a little different for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always fun to try this thing. So Bella, thank you very, very much. Thank you so uh, much, Dr. Baker. Also, sure. Sure. And everybody <laughs> have a great day and we'll see some of you guys tomorrow then. Okay. Everybody take care. Bye-bye now. Bye.